At First Rounds on Me, we believe that one real date is better than 100 pen pals. With our mobile dating app, we make it fun and easy for you to meet someone in person for a real date. See someone you're interested in? We help plan your date. Pick a drink, a time, a venue, and send that person a date invite. It's that simple. You only get one confirmed date per day. Give your full attention to one person at a time so you can actually get to know each other in person. Our key differentiators allow you to focus on what's most important, dating with intention and connecting with someone in person. Once your date is confirmed, you only get 12 hours to chat before your date starts. If you're tired of the endless small talk with pen pals on other dating apps, First Rounds on Me is for you. So welcome back to Crowdsourcing Love. I'm Marin, and today I have Marsha Inhorn from the book Motherhood on Ice, The Mating Gap and Why Women Freeze Their Eggs. Hi, Marsha. Hi, so nice to be here with you, Marin. Thank, thanks for coming. It's a Friday afternoon in the summer, so I really appreciate your time. Um, before we get started, though, and get into the content of your book, which I loved, I want to learn a little bit more about you. So could you give us a little bit more context? I know you're a professor at Yale. What else do you do? Well, let's see. I'm a professor at Yale. I'm mm -hmm. an anthropologist, a medical anthropologist. And so I work on women's reproductive health issues and men's reproductive health issues, too. I've been doing that for a very long time. Honestly, most of my work has been in the Middle East, uh, but I ended up doing a big study, which we're going to talk about, with American women who froze their eggs. And it ended up in my book called Motherhood on Ice, The Mating Gap and Why Women Freeze Their Eggs. And beyond that, um, I'm a mom of two, I'll call them millennial children, one boy and one girl. Um, I struggled myself to get my children. And so I really, I have to say, feel great empathy for women who are struggling in any way with their reproduction. And, um, you know, I think uh, I actually include a little bit of that story in the prologue to my book uh, mm -hmm. to, to talk about, you know, women's aspirations, trying to have a career, trying to have a family, and sometimes the difficulty of pulling that off. Um, yeah. And uh, what else? I, I, I grew up in the Midwest uh, yep. in Wisconsin, was just there with my parents who are in their 90s. And uh, we all are string players. We all play different string instruments. So mine was the cello. And how do you like working at Yale? It's pretty, it's pretty prestigious. Yeah, you know, I've been here at Yale for 15 years. Um, I've been at, you know, actually a variety of different institutions sort of all over the country. I, I'm a Midwesterner. So my last institution was the University of Michigan. Mm -hmm. I was there for a while and, you know, moved out here in 2008. And, you know, I've had many wonderful students at Yale, some of whom have gone on to study women's health issues around the world. And so, you know, it's been it's been overall a very rewarding experience, I would say. That's with some cool. very smart students. I think the best part of it is just being able to be with them um, and mentor, you know, wonderful young people. Yeah, that's really cool. So what kind of drew you to this subject matter? Because, you know, in this book, you talk about egg freezing, which is a relatively new technology. And then the thing that really hit me was, you know, you talk about the mating gap. Um, so what kind of drew you to the subject matter in general? Yeah, so for more than 30 years now, everything I've done, all my research has been actually on the issue of infertility, you know, people having trouble conceiving and all of the assisted reproductive technologies that have come down the road. You know, first we had IVF and then there's a technology for male infertility called ICSI. And then, you know, so these new technologies keep evolving from the sort of base of IVF. There's a new assisted reproductive technology that's probably going to be approved. It's called, the official name is really oocyte cryopreservation through this new procedure called vitrification or flash freezing. And it's going to be approved by the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. You know, the experimental label was lifted at the end of 2012. We should study it. You know, what kind of women are going to be freezing their eggs with this new technology? And I should say that originally it was intended, if you will, for women facing dire medical um, emergencies, especially young women with cancer who, you know, by going through chemotherapy and radiation, it 
really could affect their fertility negatively. Mm -hmm. And so there was a real clinical need for egg freezing. But actually, you know, healthy women who didn't have cancer or any health problems um, heard about this new technology and began volunteering for clinical trials. And so it was realized that there's this population of non-medical healthy women who wanted to freeze their eggs. And Mm -hmm. really, that's the population over the past decade um, that's really boomed. I mean, there are thousands of American women who've now undertaken egg freezing, and the technology is spread all around the world. You know, there are at least 80 countries that are regularly performing egg freezing. So it is a 10-year-old you know, technology that's really taken off because it serves a really important purpose, uh, which we can talk about, including for women who are healthy. And that's really what my book is about, healthy women who decided to freeze their eggs. Yeah, that's so interesting. So in the book, you talk about American women freeze their eggs mainly because they cannot find a partner to reproduce with. So what is the barrier for these women? You know, why is it so hard for everyone to find a partner? Because I'm 31 And the reason why I don't, I'm not married yet or I don't have kids yet is partially because I've not found the right partner. So I'm experiencing the the mating gap myself. Right. So can I tell you a little bit about the genesis of this whole issue that I found in my study? You know, egg freezing in the early days and still the media representation of egg freezing is that women are doing it for career planning purposes, that this is all about, you know, women, ambitious, career striving, selfish women who are trying to put their fertility off because they want to have this super career and climb the corporate ladder. And, you know, that is a very profound and still very uh, widespread notion that egg freezing is all about career. And in fact, I want to say the American Society for Reproductive Medicine wants to officially call egg freezing planned oocyte cryopreservation, as if all women are planning this thing to do this very intentionally. And so I didn't know what I was going to find. I started doing a big study Mm -hmm. um, supported by the U.S. National Science Foundation. I started in 2014. And my really my major hypothesis is that, oh, this must be about career, educational and career planning. Mm -hmm. And I have to say within the first 10 or so interviews, it's like my hypothesis is not working out here. This has nothing to do with career planning. I'm interviewing women. All of the women in the study had already undertaken at least one cycle of egg freezing. So they'd already done it. And these were women who were already established in their careers. They were already in their 30s. Mm -hmm. Um, In fact, the mean age at egg freezing was 36, age 36. Okay. And, you know, these were women who who already had it together with their professional lives. But the thing that had had eluded them uh, was finding the partner. And so, you know, I'd ask this little series of sort of sociodemographic questions like, you know, how old are you? Where were you born? Where did you go to school? What's your highest degree? Are you single, married, divorced? And women would go single, 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 single. Mm-hmm. That's why I'm freezing my eggs. That's what I want to talk about. And it was such a, 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 an overwhelming finding. I mean, 82% mm-hmm. of the women that I interviewed had frozen their eggs because they were single at the time. And that meant either they were single because they just couldn't find the right partner, you know, sort of what you're expressing, mm-hmm. or there was a significant group of women who were single because they just had a major breakup a divorce, a broken engagement, you know, a long-term relationship that had broken up, Mm -hmm. often very devastating, you know, and like now I'm in my late 30s, I've just gotten divorced after seven years, you know, I've used up my 30s, what am I going to do? So there were both women who just hadn't found the partner and women who lost a partner, if you will. And so 82% of the women froze their eggs being single and, you know, partnership problems thus were the huge finding of this study. And that's really, I think what my book is trying to convey is that this is about women who are struggling to find a partner. And I ended up calling it the mating gap because for me, the definition was the lack of eligible, educated, equal partners for this population of educated women. And we can talk about it, issues of education, had a lot to do with it, which we can talk about as well. Yeah, no, that's that's really interesting. 
In the book, you talk about how smart women want smart men, but men don't necessarily have the same priorities. Can you speak more to that? Yeah. And so, you know, the first issue is that the women who are freezing their eggs are are educated and professionally successful because they have to have the money to pay for this expensive technology. It's minimally $10,000 to do one cycle of egg freezing and often can be double that cost. So it's a Mm -hmm. lot of money. And in order to afford it, you know, women are, they're educated professional women. That's the egg freezing demographic, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So these are women who are very successful and a sort of a, a, a issue that they brought to the fore is, you know, who do you marry? If you want to find an equal partner, yeah. you know, somebody who's not intimidated of your professional success, you know, h- how are you going to find that person? Because uh, for the, f- the first problem is there are millions more educated American women now than there are educated American men in the age 22 to 39 age group. Okay. And this is a huge educational disparity. Women have been succeeding in higher education much more than American men. So you've got this, what, a man deficit, an edu- a college-educated man deficit in the U.S. There simply are not enough educated American men for the numbers of educated American women. So that's mm-hmm. one issue. And then, you know, in, in America, and I'm going to say in probably most societies around the world, we have these sort of gender norms that, you know, women are supposed to what in anthropology we call hy- hypergamy, marry up. They're oh, supposed to find somebody yep. a little older, a little more educated, yep. a little more professionally successful, right? Mm-hmm. And men, their expectation is hypogamy, marrying down, you know, somebody mm-hmm. younger and fertile. Um, you and know, beautiful. somebody who doesn't necessarily have the have the career together yet, right? Mm-hmm. These are really strong gender norms that still haven't gone away. And so if you're a woman who is, you know, I'm going to just say sort of at the top in terms of education and career, you know, you're at, you've hit a glass ceiling, like where would you go to look up? Mm. So, you know, what women really want, like you're saying, is an equal partner. They want somebody who kind of understands them, is sort of from a similar background, Mm -hmm. who supports their career, who supports their desire to have a family. And that proved incredibly difficult for, for women in the study, you know, and I'm going to say really a remarkable group of women. I, yeah. I was just so sort of impressed with these women who volunteered to talk to me, you know, one after another, it was like, wow, you know, beautiful, eloquent, mm-hmm. successful, interesting, funny, you know, women saying like, I just can't find a guy I haven't dated in several years. I'm a dateable woman. You know, what's the matter here? But why were they not, why were they not dating for several years? Um, not that they hadn't tried, not that they had. Oh, really? Like they couldn't get a date. Um, in some cities it is very difficult. I mean, I heard, I interviewed a lot of women in the Washington DC metropolitan area. They said it is torture to date. You know, it's just torture. You can try and Mm -hmm. men won't get back to you or they get back to you, go on dates and, Honestly, there was a lot of just the stories were very depressing to hear. Yeah. A lot of misogyny. And also like, you know, women who, you know, were working in really interesting jobs, you know, as international economists or working mm-hmm. for big federal agencies or working for the White House or whatever. When men would meet them and find out that that's what they did, the men were often intimidated and said things like, oh, my God, that means you're smarter than I am. You know, oh, so. Really? It just, yeah, really some sort of shocking. And so this issue of like men need to be amazed and 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 see women's, you know, educational career success as an asset, not as something that emasculates them. So that I think is a huge issue. Women also like talked about the fact that, you know, and here's an issue on women's side, like, you know, I don't really want to settle into a relationship with somebody who just doesn't do it for me. You know, I don't want yeah. to have to make compromises. I've seen way too many bad marriages. I've seen my friends who married somebody that wasn't quite the right fit and they got divorced. I don't want to have to go through that. So women talked a lot about, you know, that maybe they had higher expectations for relationships, Okay. you know, that their moms had told them, you know, don't settle, you know, make sure that you're, successful both in your career and your relationship, you know, 
And so women talked about maybe they have more expectations today for men, but that men's commitments to the entire mating thing, you know, to actually partnering and, and becoming fathers, yeah. they women felt that that is on the wane, that is on the decline, that a lot of men are just putting it off, yep. not committing, don't want the responsibility, don't see themselves married with kids. And that's the kind of generational shift um, that we can talk about. Yeah, it sounds like, I mean, it seems like it's a bit of a societal problem. I know that you talk about the Peter Pans out there and the phenomenon of men who are just comfortable and they don't want to, you know, quote unquote, grow up, you know, get married, have a family. You know, is that a trend that we're seeing in Western society or culture? Yeah, I mean, it's actually been reported uh, in the West in general, in parts of Western Europe, you know, men sort of putting off partnership and and becoming fathers, really putting it off until late 30s, 40s, 50s in some cases. And there's actually really good demographic data from places like Norway okay. um, that, you know, the same thing's going on. Men saying that they intend to partner and become fathers, but, you know, not doing it by the age of 45. And so... I heard a lot about this and I actually, you know, because I'm from an older generation, mm -hmm. I hadn't heard the term Peter Pans, yep. but it was actually women in California in, in the tech and Bay area, you know, Silicon Valley and Bay area said, Oh my God, San Francisco is just full of Peter Pans. And I said, you know, well, what do you mean exactly? Peter Pans can be actually successful men themselves, you mm -hmm. know, with money and a good career. And, you know, women said they often like will wine and dine you and maybe string you along for a while. But if you invest in them and really expect these men to come through for you, you know, forget about it. You know, mm -hmm. you're going to be disappointed because their intention is, you know, they feel on some level single at heart, you know, just want to play the field, you know, don't intend to really partner up for the long term. And so I, I heard a lot about that, you know, mm -hmm. and I heard women had different names for different kinds of men, you know, um, women in, in Silicon Valley, you know, where there are a lot of men um, said, you know, yeah, the odds are good, but the goods are odd. You know, men in tech tend to be kind of low on emotional intelligence, you know, not the most dateable men. Okay. I ended up with this table in the cha first chapter of my book called A Woman's Lexicon, The Ten Types of Men, A Woman's Lexicon, with, you know, the alpha males, the beta males, mm -hmm. the, the foreign service men. The, which they called Yale, Pale, and Male, by the way, you know, women who worked in the Foreign Service. But yeah, um, yeah just about different kinds of men who, you know, you, you could go out with, but if you hope to partner, really partner mm -hmm. with them, you were going to find yourself in a struggle. So it was, in some senses, a bit shocking to me, you know, because I am the next generation up. And I felt right. like, wait a second, things have not changed enough your generation is still struggling with some of the issues that I saw in my generation. Yeah. You know, and yeah. So you're saying your generation struggled with the same problem because I thought part of the problem was that, you know, dating culture has become gamified with dating apps and it just seems like there's a never ending supply of people. And so people become very disposable very quickly. So you're saying your generation though had a similar problem with people, you know, settling down together. Yeah, I think, I think that, well, two things. I think in my generation, um, there was more expectation that you should settle down, that mm. you should partner, that you, you should have children. You know, I think that that was um, an expectation that I think is shifting quite dramatically. I think, you know, the younger generation, you know, I think things are changing. People in the younger generation will not necessarily have children because our planet is declining and so forth. But, you know, 30 years and up, you know, people did marry, tended to get married and have kids. And that was an expectation. But I guess what I saw in my generation, especially since I did go to graduate school, I got a Ph.D. and a master's degree. I saw a lot of women like me, you know, who were seeking higher education and wanted to be something, you know, wanted to be some kind of professional. Really, we had trouble finding partners, too. Mm -hmm. um, and and a lot of people that I know did kind of settle for a partner who really, you know, wasn't good. And there were divorces and there was unhappiness. So mm -hmm. I, I saw that back in my own generation. I struggled to find my partner. Um, I struggled to have my children, you know. So, yeah, I, I went through the struggle that I heard a lot of the women in my study still having. 
And I okay. thought, why have things not shifted? It's 30 years on. Like, why why have these norms? Or why are these problems of partnership, you know, still persisting? And I think maybe, as you're saying, the added pressures or the added problem now mm-hmm. of the whole online dating market. And, you know, just it's, it's, you know, everybody does it, but women often described it as torture. You know, it's a lot of time. It's a time sink. And it may not end up, find, you know, <laughs> creating a perfect partner for you. Right. Yeah. It, and it you, just even you've had experience with that. Well, and yeah, and I've, I'm also guilty of some of these bad habits when it comes to dating culture within, you know, dating apps because everyone's busy and you don't take it as seriously because it's not like you've met this person, you know, in person or you have like a mutual friend. And so I think there's just like a lot of bad behavior. I don't think I'm doing anything like super malicious, but it's like it's easy to forget about people or to ghost or whatever and not follow up. And so I'm also guilty as a woman. Um, I think I think we're I think both parties are probably like hold different levels of responsibility because like I do want to settle down. I do want to find a partner. But, you know, the whole reason I did my 28 dates in February was to kind of reset my my focus on actually being mindful and intentional around, you know, finding somebody. And I'm six months out from it. I still haven't found somebody, but it's hard to consistently date and put yourself out there. It's a lot of energy. Yes, a lot of energy. I mean, that's what I heard from women. You know, mm-hmm. women said you have a full time job, you know, and then you go home and you have the second job. It's so yeah. to really do it and to you know not ghost and to follow up. It takes so much work, and I, yeah. I think almost everybody in the study had done it or was doing it. It is just the way people date now or find people mm-hmm. now, and I, I suppose you know there are deleterious consequences that you've mentioned. Um, I, I I just heard a lot about almost every single dating app you know women had tried at one point or another. Yeah, and some women sort of given up and actually were hiring matchmakers yep. or consultants to help them with their profiles on dating apps. I mean, you know, it was just a lot of work and money sometimes too going into it. Um, oh, there's a ton of money in the dating industry for sure. Yeah. Um, yes. so what were, what was the through line that women were describing when they were talking about like what they wanted in a suitable partner? Did you notice any themes? I know that you, we already talked about, you know, the egalitarian, like they wanted someone who was smarter or above them, but were there other things that they talked about that they wanted in a suitable partner? Yeah. I mean, I think women, um, one, one of my friends and colleagues said, you know, uh, you talk about the three E's, you know, eligible, educated, and, um, and gosh, I'm forgetting the 30 eligible, educated, and uh, there for you, earnest. You know, okay. she said you should put you should put earnest down as the third E because, you know, you want to find a man who is actually enthusiastic. You know, really like wants to date, wants to go out, wants to share life with you. Um, and something that I found, you know, women who did have partners, there was a lot of partnership ending in my study too. Mm-hmm. You know, women who had tried to be with men. Um, sometimes, you know, it's just talked about like sort of men who just weren't sort of doing their share, I guess, in mm-hmm. the relationship, you know, putting the energy into the relationship mm-hmm. and, you know, women saying like, I just found over time, you know, I was doing everything. If we were planning to take a trip together, I had to make all the arrangements. You know, I helped him with his job applications. Yeah. I, you know, we went to the egg freezing and this was often like the deal breaker for women. You know, we went to the egg freezing and yeah, he helped me with the injections, but we get there, you know, and then afterwards, like there's no discussion about like, what are we going to do with the eggs? And it's clear that he doesn't really, you know, he's not really into it. Mm -hmm. There were actually cases where women, you know, thought they were with the one, Mm -hmm. they did the egg freezing. And then like, there was a breakup the next day, you know, the guy bailed on the woman, Mm -hmm. or it was so clear that the, the man had no intention of ever providing sperm for a future embryo. So just, I think, um, you know, wanting to have an equal guy who is equally enthusiastic about the partnership, you know, process yeah. of wanting to be a parent with a woman. Yeah. I, you know, the, the, the other three, you know, I had this term, the three P's. Mm-hmm. Women wanted to be partnered, pregnant, and parent, you know, parents. Yeah. They wanted to be pregnant with their own eggs. With a, They wanted a partner to do it with, to use the partner's sperm. And they wanted a partner who was really interested in reproduction with them, you know, a stable, committed, reproductive partner. Yeah. And so, 
you know, that was key. I mean, when you get to the point where you're really thinking about mm-hmm. egg freezing or you're going to do egg freezing, you as a woman are thinking about all of those things. Like, I want to have children. When am I going to do it? And with whom am I going to do it? Yeah. And so I think that was crucial, you know, finding a guy who was also interested in pursuing that path. Yeah, that's really interesting because I feel like there are those like big moments in life that reveal who a person truly is. And I can see how the egg freezing process could be one of those. So kind of going back to just kind of like the egg freezing process. I know you spoke to 150 women during their experience of freezing their eggs. What is the physical burden, the emotional burden, the financial burden? You know, it's really intense. And sometimes people will tell me it's the best thing you can do. Like, just do it. But like, I think that, you know, people who have told me to do it, they do it with you know, my, my best interest at heart, but I do want to talk about like what the process looks like, you know, and the, the good, the bad, the ugly. Yeah. Thank you. These are all excellent questions, you know, by the way, and I'm, oh, I'm glad you. you brought it up. I actually feel that women who decide to pursue egg freezing and really go through it, I think it requires a lot of bravery. I mm-hmm. actually use the term bravery. You know, you have to be courageous to do it because as you're pointing out, you know, it's a huge financial burden. I mean, for one cycle, we're talking ten to twenty thousand dollars, depending on how much medication you need. You need to self-inject hormones into your body, mostly in your stomach, but you have to do a major trigger shot in the muscle in your buttock. And if you're by yourself doing that, it's very difficult to do. And a lot of women, a lot of people have needle phobia, so mm-hmm. you know the the self-injection was daunting for a lot of women. It takes bravery to be able to do that. Yeah. And then is the actual egg retrieval, which is a small operation. It's done transvaginally where they retrieve the eggs. You know, you have to go in, by the way, every day, for, you know, for a, a period of several weeks where they're monitoring the development of your eggs and your follicles on ultrasound. And so it's a logistically complex process. It requires often getting up early in the morning, going to a clinic every day with a lot of monitoring. And then on the day of egg retrieval, when the eggs are ready to be harvested, as it were, it is a small operation. You have to be accompanied. You cannot go home by yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you go home, you know, women said that they, some some women said, well, some women said it was easy peasy. I didn't feel much. I was fine the next day. But a lot of women didn't feel that way. It was like hormonally difficult. They had bloating, pain, didn't feel good. They had to miss more work than they anticipated. And you have to have an accompaniment. You know, you have to have somebody go with you, at Mm -hmm. least for that day. Yeah. And that also brought forth the loneliness aspects of this whole thing. And so actually, you know, the first chapter of the second half of my book, which is really about the experience of egg freezing, is this, you know, single women braving a couple's world. Because egg freezing is mostly done in IVF clinics, and IVF clinics are designed for married couples who are infertile who are going through IVF because they are infertile. Mm -hmm. And so there's a male partner usually accompanying, you know, a woman or the male partner might be infertile, but they're there as a partnership, right? Yeah. Women, freezing women are usually doing this alone by themselves, you know, going through the monitoring, the injection classes on their own. And a lot of women said it made them feel so stigmatized, so lonely, kind of looking around at all the other people, seeing which women had rings on their fingers, And clinics often are not well enough adjusted to the fact that they have this new population of single egg freezing women. Mm -hmm. They haven't adjusted their consent forms. You know, the consent forms say, and will your partner be accompanying you on the day? Or, you know, what are you going to do with your eggs? Is your partner going to provide, you know, sperm? And so clinics need to do a lot of work to really accommodate the feeling, if you will, um, of this new population of single women coming in for egg freezing. Yeah. So I had a huge chart in my book, all suggestions by women in my study on what clinics could really do to make the whole process more patient centered, like what we could call patient centered egg freezing to make it a better experience for single women going solo. Um, it is a big deal. And there there can be, actually with IVF too, there can be real hormonal complications. There is a, a rather serious uh, side effect complication called ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome where, you know, you get very bloated dangerously after the egg oh, wow. retrieval. You know, that happened to at least a couple people in my study. So it's not an easy thing. It's not a, 
it's not something one should just do, you know, lightheartedly. Right. I don't think anybody does egg freezing lightheartedly. I think it takes a lot of courage, you know, a lot of bravery. I, um, women in my studies said, you know, you have to be a badass to do this. And I, 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 I think I said it takes badass bravery to freeze your eggs. Yeah. I think it does. I think it really, we need to emphasize that. And therefore, you know, at the end of the book, I talk about my own feelings or my own sort of sense of recommendations after doing this large study. I really don't think it's something that women in their 20s should be taking, you know, lightheartedly like, oh, just graduated from college. My parents will pay for egg freezing. I don't think that's the correct time. Really? Most, most women in their 20s are fertile. They don't have problems with their fertility and they might find a partner along the way, you know. But I think egg freezing is something that women should consider actually at your age. Um, 31? In the 30s. In okay. the 30s. Or yeah. 30s. If you don't have a partner, mm -hmm. if you really, really know that you really want to be pregnant with your own eggs, you know, at some point down the road, um, then in the early 30s, women, you know, who are, have the means should start thinking about it. Because another thing I discovered is that most women have no sense of what we would call age-related fertility decline. Like we're never taught in school, like when does fertility start to decline? And for women, it starts to decline, starts to decline at age 32. By age 37, there's a precipitous decline in women's fertility, which has been called the fertility cliff. I mean, it really starts to decline in the late 30s. And so ideally, if you're going to do this, it should be somewhere in what we'd say the early to mid 30s, not the late 30s to early 40s. And I, I feel American women in this regard have really been misled because mm -hmm. there's so much attention in celebrity culture to, you know, women in their late 40s or their early 50s who seem to be having children, right. you know, being pregnant. But honestly, that's probably with donor eggs. They're just not talking about it. So yeah, that makes sense. Egg freezing, yeah, egg freezing is it's difficult. And, it, you know, if you're going to do it, I think sort of, you know, early to mid 30s is a sort of moment of consideration. OK, that makes sense. And when you were talking to all these women, did you feel like the biggest cost was the like what was the biggest burden for them? The emotional toll, the financial toll or the physical toll? Like what what did they kind of, you know, describe to be the most difficult part of it? Well, you know, I think we, I think that women recognized that in general, the biggest toll of egg freezing is going to be the financial toll for most women. Okay. Most women in our society cannot easily come up on their own with $15,000. You know, most women, especially younger women or women in their 30s, you know, maybe they don't have that in savings, you know, so sort of coming up with the money is, is hard. And the women I interviewed who were able to do it, they had undertaken at least one cycle. And some of them, I mean, there were a couple who had taken up to four cycles of egg freezing just to get the enough eggs. It was very difficult to get enough eggs. So that's a lot of money. And women said, you know, fortunately, because I have a really good salary, I was able to do it. I didn't have to take out a loan. More than 90% of the women I interviewed were able to pay for egg freezing on their own one way or another. Okay. But for some, it was really hard. They had to take out like a new credit card or they had to use all their savings. Some women did have to borrow from their parents. You know, it wasn't easy. And at the end of the, when I asked, you know, at the end of each interview, I said, well, do you have any recommendations um, that you would think would be helpful? The main one was the price that needs to be brought down or something needs to be done about financing or we need health insurance for this because mm. frankly, it is so expensive and I have a sister or I have a best friend who would really benefit from mm -hmm. the technology, but there's no way she'll ever be able to afford it. Yeah. So they were, they were upset about that. You know, why is it so expensive where women trying to save, you know, extend, preserve and extend our fertility. We want to prevent ourselves from having to go through IVF. We don't want to be infertile. Egg freezing holds out this promise that mm -hmm. you can, you know, preserve where you are at the age that you are. So why is it, why is it so expensive and why doesn't health insurance cover it? There was a huge issue for women. So financially, I think it, it becomes an exclusionary technology because most yeah. women simply can't afford it, you know, and that for me is a reproductive justice issue. Um, the definition of reproductive justice is the right to have children, the right not to have children and the right to parent children in safe and healthy environments. 
And egg freezing is a technology that does help some women mm -hmm. with the right to have children. And so if it's a justice issue, why isn't, you know, society sort of making it more feasible? Yeah, no, that makes sense. Also, isn't there something where like men over 40, their sperm becomes less effective or there's yeah. a greater chance for them to have children with maybe a disability or just something like that? Do you know about that? And can you speak to it? Yeah, I have spent, you know, much of my research career working on male infertility. Mm -hmm. Male infertility is a worldwide under acknowledged and important male reproductive health issue. Okay. In fact, I'm just going to say of all the world's cases of infertility, and it's estimated to be a, as many as 186 million infertile couples around the world, more than half of all cases of involuntary childlessness involve male infertility. So men need to wake up to the fact that they might be infertile. And, you know, men have reproductive health problems too. But even if men do have, you know, viable sperm, we are now recognizing that, you know, aging sperm is just like aging, just like aging eggs, uh, not as good when mm -hmm. you, men get older. And so, you know, there can be increasing male infertility over time, especially, especially for men who smoke, um, men who've been exposed to various toxic chemicals over the course of their professional lives. So that's an issue. And then, you know, just um, the decline in the quality of sperm for men in their 40s and 50s. Um, and and the, there was serious concern that it has um, what are being called paternal effects on their offspring. That okay. some conditions of children actually may be due to the, the poor quality of the father's sperm. I mean, we know that, you know, Down syndrome is related to the age of women's eggs. Well, they're appear to be certain conditions that could be linked to the paternal age of sperm. So we need to be concerned about it. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I know in the book you talk about ageism and how, you know, you start the book by talking about um, a character you call, well, she's a real person, but you give her the name Kayla and how, you know, I think she was maybe 40 and she was dating somebody and everyone said, you know, there's something wrong with her. She's 40 and she hasn't been married yet. Did a lot of the women that you um, interviewed, did they experience ageism as well? Yeah. In fact, um, I'm, I'm, thank you for bringing up the story. You know, all of the stories that I um, use in the book, you know, they're based on real people. I do change the names and try to sort of anonymize to some degree you mm -hmm. know, certain personal details. But these are real women's stories. I did interview 150 women, 36 of them were doing medical egg freezing mm -hmm. and 114 of them were doing, you know, um, non-medical egg freezing. They were healthy women like Kayla and they are really the basis of this book. So this is really about, you know, women who are healthy and yeah, she just, she, you know, she, she was such a nice person. She was, you know, an engineer and scientist by training came from a family with all brothers. And she said, mm -hmm. you know, I have so many guys who are friends. I have wonderful male friends, but you know, they don't want to date me. And, you know, and she did find, she moved to the Bay area and she did find men to date, but, you know, they were these sort of Peter Panish kind of men mm -hmm. who, like, stole her time, really. You yeah. Know? So eventually she gets into her late 30s. The man who she froze her eggs with, um, you know, he was nice. He went through the egg freezing with her. But then she realized he has no intention of using these eggs with me. Mm. It was very heartbreaking. And then she found another man who you know, very, she's a very handsome professional man, but he and his friends, she, she talked very openly. They were so critical of women, you know, the way their bodies were, mm -hmm. women's aging. They said very misogynistic things about women's bodies. And she said, well, wait a second, you know, um, you know, what is this all about? It's really, you know, it's very ageist and, mm -hmm. you know, so yes, all of those things happen to women and women said, you know, the, the older you get into your thirties, the late thirties, Men just run from you. They do not want to date women in their late 30s often because they're so afraid that these are women who are going to be desperate to have a child now. And so men become very ageist toward women in their late 30s. That was a recurring theme. And so to some degree, you know, women who had frozen their eggs could tell women, uh, could tell men on their dates, no, I'm not worried about my age. I froze my eggs, you mm -hmm. know, men finding it kind of shocking at first, but like, oh, that's cool. That's like modern science. Mm. Good for you. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I do have to say freezing 
one's eggs isn't a guarantee. So, you know, that's an issue. Like you can freeze your eggs, but it doesn't mean that they're going to work when you're in your 40s. And in Kayla's case, you know, she followed up with me. She ended up at the age of 45. She moved to another city, hoping it would be better in a different place. And she still hadn't found her partner by age 45. And she was mystified. And I'm going to say a lot of women were just mystified. Like, I don't know what's wrong. Like, I must be doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. And one of the the themes I really critiqued is this theme of self-blame. You know, women blaming themselves that somehow they had done something wrong. They had been too picky. They should have settled for their college boyfriend. They should have done something differently. They should have put more effort into online dating. So much self-blaming for Mm -hmm. a situation that I want to just say is women are not alone. There are millions of women in this situation. Yeah. Women in their 30s who are not partnered, can't figure out why, are perfectly dateable, lovable women, but yeah. they can't find a partner. And that's why I really wanted to emphasize this issue that I'm calling the the mating gap, that there is literally a demographic gap going on between men and women in our country. Yeah, that's so interesting. I know you also talk about, well, before I say that, I just want to say that women who are single in our society and are braving just the world alone, they are superheroes. Like, you know what I mean? Like there's so much that they do and like there's shame and stigma on top of it for being single. And so I just want to shout out to everyone who's listening. Like if you are single, like there's no shame and you're a badass, first of all. And I'm guessing you I agree. agree <laughs> I totally agree with you. I, I'm yeah. not a woman. I, I think my book is full of stories of these badass, incredible women mm-hmm. who will, after they read the book, if they choose to read it, will not feel alone anymore. I mean, if there's one thing the book does is to say, you know, this is a category, a demographic of people who are facing a similar problem, not of their own making. This is yep. not about individual women doing something wrong. This is a societal, social, and demographic issue, and we should celebrate women who are doing so well educationally Mm -hmm. and professionally in the world today, and I'm sorry that if men are not keeping up, that is a problem too, which is being addressed by a lot of scholars, the sort of decline of men in education and labor markets. We need to do something to, as one of the women in my study said, we need to do something to fix men. Somebody needs to help men along but there are implications for women that are real and egg freezing is really the consequence of these sort of this mating gap problem. And so women should not feel that they did something wrong. They should not blame themselves. They should not feel stigmatized. All the bad stuff and the loneliness and the shame that women feel, I just wish it could be lifted from their shoulders. And I I think that is a message from my book, you know, and one that women, women themselves, said you know in women's own voices in the book yeah I mean your book really made me feel seen because it's like you're right ever since I graduated college I've been you know just hoping and looking for that person who I wanted to build a life with and it's frustrating that you know like 10 10 years later I still haven't found that person um so I really felt seen by your book so thank you um thank you yeah in in your book you talk about the men as partners problem what is that? And then you also talk about how society needs to change on the man's side. So can you speak to like some of the solutions that there are potentially? Yeah. You know, so um, actually in international reproductive health circles, you know, in the literature about reproductive health internationally, there is something called the men as partners problem. And so I basically adopted this term from like global public health to say American women have a men as partners problem too. It's not just an issue in the global South, you know, where men maybe are not living up to their partnership responsibilities. There's abandonment and sexually transmitted infections and, you know, problems that women face around the world. But, you know, women in America seem to be having a men as partners problem too. So I really use that term and focused on the issue of partnerlessness. I mean, that is really what's at stake here. Mm -hmm. Women having trouble finding a partner And just like you, you know, women said, look, I'm educated. I went to college and then I went to graduate school. The vast majority of women in the study, about 80% of them had gone on beyond the the bachelor's level, Mm -hmm. you know, like about almost half of the women had a master's degree and then some had MDs, PhDs, JDs and so forth. But, you know, they were educated, but said, you know, all along, you know, 
gra- college, after college. It's not like my education and career like prevented me from looking for a partner. Mm-hmm. I've been looking for a partner all along, you know. Some of my friends found their partners in college or in med school or in graduate school, but I didn't. And I just can't figure out why. Why me? You know, why me? That was a big question. Like, cannot figure it out. It's just this this enigma of my life. And so, you know, I, I said, these women have a men's partners problem. They're having f- trouble finding the partner. And, you know, then that is where I really, in the book, t- take a deep dive into these educational disparities. And that came because I was very inspired by another uh, author, John Berger, who's an economic reporter, a journalist, who wrote, he published a book in 2015 called Datanomics, the lopsided numbers game, something like that. Okay. And he looked at U.S. census data. He worked in New York and saw all of these amazing but unpartnered women in New York, his colleagues, like, why are they not partnered? But he just looked at U.S. census and World Bank data and really showed that there is this huge, what he called a college-educated man deficit operating in the United States and also all around the world. And so there are just millions too few educated men for the now you know, well-educated women in our country and in many other countries. And so I thought that is really important. That is a demographic issue that clearly underlies this problem of the men as partners problem. If women who are educated want a kind of equal partner, like a guy who gets their education and why it's important to them and wants to be with somebody who's, you know, smart and professional. Mm -hmm. If there are just millions too few of those men, then there's a big problem there. And so, you know, John Berger then went on to write a second book um, called Make Your Move, where he really said, you know, women... You know, you're going to have to have sort of different thinking and, you know, not wait, not wait around trying to find a guy. You need to make your move. He actually said that women need to be very bold in terms of their dating lives. They need to ask men out. They need to be, you know, don't follow traditional gender norms to be waiting around for men. They need to, like, be pretty active and mm-hmm. activist in trying yeah. to find a partner. So, I mean, I don't want to summarize this whole book. He, he should be interviewed. He's a very interesting guy. Yeah. But I really, you know, took to heart the sort of demography. And then I looked at current and contemporary educational patterns in this country. And it's not good. I mean, right now in America, there are 27% more American women in higher education than there are men. During COVID, rates of college admission dropped, and 71% of the drop was among men, not Mm -hmm. women. Um, Men are not doing well, you know. And in America, we're just honestly not a very educated society. You know, only 30-something percent of Americans have a college degree. Yeah. And so, you know, it's an issue of education in our country. And so if that is the case, like, what are women to do? What are women with a college education going to do if they want to find a partner John said, you know, women are going to need to engage in what he called mixed collar dating and mating. You know, you're going to have to like start looking at men as potential partners who just don't share your educational and professional background. Mm -hmm. And so I took that to heart because that's what I did in my own life. Um, Oh, really? I was divorced. Yeah, I was divorced um, in my early 30s. I was in graduate school and it was like, you know, what am I going to do? I actually contemplated having a child on my own using donor sperm. And that is actually something that a lot of egg freezing women think about too, which we can talk about. Mm -hmm. But then, um, you know, uh, somebody started introducing me to her friends. She said, you know, I don't want you to be partnerless. And so I got introduced to a lot of men, not 28, like Not 28, but a lot. have dating apps. (laughs) Pardon? I said not 28, but a lot. A lot. It was a lot. I dated a lot of men in the summer. And finally, I met my husband, who had dropped out of college um, in his early 20s. And he was going back to school. He was like taking, you know, courses to go back to college. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I met him, was attracted to him immediately. And I realized he's intelligent. He's Mm -hmm. kind. He had never contemplated having children. He was also divorced and hadn't thought about having kids. But we talked about it. And I said, there's one thing I know, which is that I want to have children that yeah. I know. And are you opposed to that? And he said, you know, well, I never really thought about it, but no, I'm not opposed to having kids. And so, and it, you know, we ended up living together and he became my partner. We got married within a year and it's wow. now thir- 33 years later, we have our two wonderful kids 
but we had a real hard time with our fertility because I was in my late thirties by the time we got going. Mm -hmm. And I write about that in my book, but in anyway, I engaged in, you know, mixed collar dating. My husband, you know, he wasn't on the same timeline as I, he eventually ended up getting a master's degree, but you know, years after I had, but mm. you know, I took a chance on somebody who just, you know, was different than I was. And we ended up having a real successful partnership. I mean, not perfect, but successful, you know, and we're still a family. And so I, I actually talk about that too, at the end of my book. And I have some great stories in the book yeah. I have different stories of all different kinds of things that happened. You know, some women who just decided to have a child using their frozen eggs on their own. I have some really, you know, really great stories about that. I have some stories about women who basically engaged in hypogamy. They partnered down, if you will, to men who didn't have any edu college education or had less or went to a less prestigious kind of, you know, school, but they chose to be with somebody who was, you know, working class, mm -hmm. but made a great partner and yeah. was totally having children. And so, you know, they found there were educational disparities that made no difference in the end, you know? And that's really what I ended up sort of advising. Like women may have to open up their dating apps yes. to different kinds of men, right? I agree. And even like I have a master's degree as well. And I was told by a man one time, you know, a lot of men avoid those women. And so in your book, I even saw that, you know, some women took off that they had advanced degrees. And I'm not telling women to play small, don't, because you probably don't want to be with a guy who's going to avoid the woman with the master's degree. But, you know, I, I'm i open. Like, I don't need a college-educated man. Like, if he's entrepreneurial, if he's savvy, if our values align, like, I'm really open-minded. I'll even date somebody who has kids. Like, I would be happy to have a blended family because at the end of the, at the, end of the day, I want to be, like, I, would, I just want to be partnered. And I'm not desperate, but I do value family and I do value community. And so I really want that. Yeah, and you're like, you know, you're you're exactly like the women that yeah. I talk to. You know, you're you're educated, you're beautiful, you're eloquent, you're interesting. You know, it was just, you know, that was more or less what I was seeing over and over. And by the way, women of very different ethnic and racial and religious backgrounds. You know, there had been an article in the or an op-ed in the New York Times saying that egg freezing was for white women only, and it really isn't. Women okay. of all different backgrounds are doing it. And, you know, but mostly women who have college degrees and are, you know, have edu higher education and are already, you know, accomplished in their careers for the most part. And so, you know, that was sort of the common denominator in terms of the demographic. But yeah, you know, and honestly, there are women who, like you, want the three Ps. They want mm -hmm. partnership. They want to be pregnant and experience pregnancy, many of them. I don't necessarily need also, to. Like, I will if I have okay. to, but I don't need that part. <laughs> Yeah, well, a lot of women said they really had, you know, hopes they wanted to be with their own eggs. You okay. Know? And and they wanted to be parents like you, you know, just be a family and have that experience. That's what they knew they wanted. Maybe yeah. they hadn't always known that, but they had come to realize that's what they wanted. So egg freezing does, you know, I think I called it in, in our area of scholarship, we talk about IVF as a hope technology. Mm -hmm. My colleague, at Cambridge, Sarah Franklin, in a really early book called Embodied Progress, said this is a hope technology. It doesn't always hold out hope, but it often does. Mm -hmm. And so I think egg freezing is a kind of new hope technology. It really does give, an, give women a lot of hope that they can still possibly achieve their dream yeah. of those three Ps. And it actually, I mean, I asked women at the end, you know, at the end of the day, are you, uh, you know, happy or glad that you did this mm -hmm. and more than 90 percent of women had at least one positive thing to say about it okay. and there was kind of an outpouring I mean an outpouring of uh, relief uh, re you know relief from the psychic burden it made me feel some optimism yeah. I didn't have to like feel my timing was so pressured I could date without looking at every guy as a future you know baby daddy I mean it was just it took a lot of pressure off women and made women feel hopeful that they'd done something for themselves, a self-investment. Women felt that egg freezing had given them a lot of different um, benefits, if you will. You know, there were these many different categories of things mm -hmm. that women had to say about why they were glad they had done it. 
I, I have to say women, a word that just kept coming up over and over was I felt empowered by this somehow. It was mm. wildly and weirdly empowering to me. Like I'd done something for myself. I'd it taken give, charge of my ability. Yeah, it gives you agency, right? Like in agency. this, in our dating, in our um, culture, dating is like, it does, you don't feel like an agent as a woman because we're in a culture where men are supposed to pursue women like as the norm, as the cultural norm. And so I can see how it could give a woman that feeling of, okay, I'm finally taking the reins into my own hands. And that probably feels really good. Um, yeah, and that's, the, that's what women had to say. I had one listener question. I had m multiple. I'm really excited. I introduced you to my community um, beforehand and said, what questions do you have for her? And so many questions came through, but we have to wrap up because we're kind of going over time. Um, but one person said, I would love to see some research or data around egg freezing resulting in childbirth. So do you know that information? Yeah, I have not. Um, I didn't do like a long term follow up myself of mm -hmm. women in the study. So I don't have the data from my own study actually around the world. And it's true in the U.S. Most women, because it's a relatively new technology, most women have not yet gone back to use their eggs. Um, but for those who do, and for those who do, you know, get a sufficient number, which is an issue, like how many eggs do you need? Mm -hmm. And in my study, I have a lot of discussion about that. You know, a lot of women were told that they should get at least 20 eggs, which was a struggle for some women. But, but um, you know, if you do get a sufficient number of eggs, it can work, you know, and I, I am not a a medical doctor, mm -hmm. so I don't really want to go into the detailed statistics, but there are articles about, you know, if you get get this many number you know this number of eggs you do have a, a good you know chance of having a baby mm -hmm. <laughs> with a sufficient number of eggs and depending okay. on your your age but um but I do but I do want to emphasize that still most women haven't gone back to get their eggs and there has been some research about why is that and guess what? It is because women have not found a partner yet and they don't mm -hmm. want to parent on their own. But I do have to say many women in my study were thinking about using their frozen eggs on their own and just doing, you know, what's called a single mother by choice, becoming a single mother by choice. Although one might say it's more by circumstance than by choice that a lot of women make that decision. But I have stories, powerful stories in my book about women who just said, you know, what the heck? I haven't found the partner. Now I'm 41. I've said to myself that I reached my 40s and didn't have a partner. I'm going to do it on my own. And having those frozen eggs, mm -hmm. it did work, you know, including for some women who didn't have a lot of eggs and didn't have a really great fertility pro profile. They still, it worked for them and they got their little frozen egg baby. Oh, so well, that's so I hopeful. Don't yeah, it is hopeful. There were some wonderful stories of women for whom it did succeed and some stories of women for whom it did not succeed. So okay. everything, I tried to represent the real range of what can happen right. with frozen eggs in the book Motherhood on Ice. No, that makes sense. Um, last thing before we go, um, of course, I'll have you plug yourself, but I always end my podcast by having my guests give my audience their biggest piece of dating advice or a mantra that they can walk away with. Yeah, you know, women, you even if you haven't found your partner, you women, you're amazing. I want to celebrate women and I want to celebrate the success of women in your generation for getting great educations, becoming really wonderful professional women. I mean, I value that very much myself and to not blame yourself if you can't find your partner, but to open your mind a little bit and maybe consider the kinds of men that maybe you didn't think you would ever partner with. You could find your magical unicorn mm -hmm. of a partner um, among, uh, among a different dating pool. Let's put it that way. And that's what I did myself. And I highly recommend it. Amazing. Well, thank you again for your time today. Please plug yourself. Where can people find you? Um, and then I'll be posting everything on my um, in the show notes as well. But yeah, where can people find you? Oh, this has been wonderful. I really appreciate being here. Um, the book is available in three versions as a hard copy book, as an ebook, and as an audio as a Kindle book, and as an audio book. It's available on Amazon. It's also available through New York University Press, which is my publisher. Uh, and I have a variety of different articles and media stories about it on my own website, which is www 
marshainhorn.com. Amazing. And then are you on social media at all, Marsha? Uh, I don't use Instagram or Twitter. Uh, no, I have my website. And okay. I'm available. You can find me through Yale University. So, you know, my name is Marsha, M-A-R-C-I-A, Inhorn, I-N-H-O-R-N. If you look me up, you'll find something about my book, Motherhood on Ice. <laughs> yes, and I highly recommend it. I have it, the hardcover, as well as the Audible version. So definitely get it. Thank you again, Marsha. I appreciate your time. Oh, thank you, Amar. And this was a wonderful interview. And thanks for your excellent questions. I'm yeah. glad to be with you and your community. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks again to our sponsor, First Rounds on Me. If you're tired of endless small talk with an overwhelming number of pen pals, go download First Rounds on Me now and get yourself a real date.